Welcome to the second lecture for Urban Anthropology. The course materials for Module 2 consider how cities themselves develop the way they do, with a particular focus on three topics, public space, revanchism, and the panopticon. You'll note that this module is called the production of urban space. So first, we have to figure out how space can be produced at all, when we generally think of it as something that just exists. Next, we'll take a look at three broad trends of concern to urban social theorists in the present day, the decline of urban public space, its policing, and its surveillance. The concept of the production of space is generally attributed to our old friend Henri Lefebvre, and especially to his 1974 book by the same name. In order to wrap our heads around what he meant by the production of space, we need to get rid of a bad habit. Thinking about space as a pre-existing and unchanging container which people fill up and move around in. For Lefebvre, space is instead produced by people. It is fundamentally social. How people produce space is highly contingent upon when they are producing it. Lefebvre was a Marxist, so as you might guess, the term production is not accidental. Lefebvre argued that every society, and hence every mode of production, produces a space, its own space. It's probably not too difficult to imagine how societies do this in a material sense. We would expect an ancient hunting and gathering society, for example, to produce space differently than a Neolithic agricultural community, just as we would expect a Neolithic farm to differ from a modern industrial one. But we don't only produce the physical landscape, though of course Lefebvre recognized this as an important part of the production of space, especially insofar as it results from production in general, or the way in which a society procures value from the environment. As we've seen through previous readings, that relationship between people and nature has a strong influence on the relationship between people themselves. And so social relations, including varying degrees of inequality and exploitation, are also deeply implicated in the production of space. The challenge is to understand how these relationships work together and how they in turn affect our perception of space. Our readings for this module reflect a widespread sense among urban social theorists that something has changed about the production of urban space in the last 50 years. They especially focus on a recent restructuring of urban space that can be traced to several historic watersheds in the way we think about cities as well as the way we govern them. The ideological roots of this restructuring lie in the rise of neoliberalism in the 1980s and its expression in urban policy in the 1990s. Many scholars point also to the intensification of a culture of fear with concomitant shifts in the policing and surveillance of urban space following the attacks of September 11, 2001 in the United States. But at base, the urban restructuring at stake in these texts might be more fundamentally traced to a broader restructuring of the capitalist economy itself most notably the deindustrialization of the 1970s, and we'll read more about this process in Module 4. One significant facet of this restructuring is what Neil Smith and Seth Lowe call the redaction of urban public space. So our first step is to understand what urban social theorists mean by public space to begin with. Public space is surprisingly difficult to define. While on the face of it, public space might logically be deemed that which is not owned privately, some scholars include in the litany of public spaces those which are used by the general public even if they are privately owned. A good example in this regard might be the shopping mall or the internet. The latter example indicates that public space is not always defined in purely physical terms, but can include digital space as well. In general, we might think of public space as those realms in which the general public claim a stake in ownership, use, access, participation, and regulation, or some combination of the above. Increasingly, we have come to conceive of public space as that which is defined by state ownership, such as the public park, the street, the sidewalk, the square, the subway, or city hall. It is important to bear in mind that this was not always the case. Collective forms of ownership and communal usufruct rights have an ancient history, though today such commons, which are not mitigated by the state, are becoming rare. One characteristic of the restructuring of the city under late capitalism is the decline of urban public space through increased privatization. 
This process is consonant with the ideology of neoliberalism, which can be a confusing term due to the way liberalism has been more frequently used in American politics in the 20th century. Smith and Lowe make the distinction in this important passage from your reading. The assertion of neoliberalism since the 1980s harkens back not to the somewhat progressive appeal of a 20th century American social liberalism, but to the more conservative doctrines of the 17th and 18th century liberalism. This neoliberalism shares in common a few basic principles with the older classical form. One, that the exercise of individual self-interest leads to the best and highest public good. Two, that private property is foundational to the self-interest. And three, that the market is the best mechanism for its expression. As Smith and Lowe note, the practice of this ideology came with historical consequences, most notably the mass dispossession of those who could not afford to buy land or participate in the market. The neoliberalism of today works by much the same logic, with much the same consequences. If one of its early results was the enclosure movement that drove the peasants of Europe to the cities, one of its late results is a new enclosure movement contributing to the production of an urban underclass which can neither return to the privatized countryside nor afford the rising cost of housing in the city. A key element of urban privatization has been the creation of what Seth Lowe calls the fortress city, characterized by walled and gated communities. One of the most acute expressions of the neoliberal production of urban space has therefore manifested in the residential housing market. This particular production of space is widespread and increasingly characterizes cities in both the global north and the global south. Neoliberalism expresses itself not only through the production of space, but through its policing. In the 1990s, Neil Smith characterized the policing of public space under neoliberalism as a form of revanchism. The concept of revanchism, French for revenge, simultaneously embodies two meanings, a reclamation of territory deemed to be lost or stolen, and a particularly vicious form of retaliation against the alleged thieves. Smith applied the term to the set of policies enacted against the urban oppressed, the homeless, prostitutes, graffiti artists, immigrants, people of color, people on benefits, under the administration of New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani in the 1990s. Such policies aimed to cleanse urban space of those deemed a threat to a white, privileged social order. But the term was first used in 19th century France, and since Smith's publication, it has been applied broadly in urban settings beyond New York. The production and policing of public space are not necessarily mutually exclusive categories. A prime example of their intersection is in antisocial architecture, which is intended to prohibit certain kinds of behaviors, and by extension, certain kinds of people, from public space by design. This phenomenon is readily observable to even the casual observer in many cities. Many such devices, such as ledges lined with spikes or public benches divided into seats, are meant to keep the homeless from sleeping on them. The policing of public space also takes place through surveillance. While this phenomenon has particularly increased in the United States in the wake of the September 11 attacks, it was already on the rise, particularly in the urban UK, where the British Security Industry Authority estimates there is now one CCTV camera for every 14 people in the nation. Some urban social theorists, following Foucault, have analyzed the proliferation of surveillance in urban public space as a form of panopticism. The panopticon was an idea for a prison thought up by English philosopher Jeremy Bentham in the 18th century. Bentham's concept was that if a prison could be designed so that the prisoners never knew when they were being watched, then fewer watchers would be required to keep them in line. Fundamentally, the panopticon is about training people to police themselves. As Roy Coleman argues in your reading for this module, the strategy has been adopted as part and parcel of a logic of social control, which convinces urbanites to participate in their own policing in an effort to present the image of a safe, crisis-free city, a keystone in the attraction of investment. The production of public space through surveillance, in this view, is directly connected to the neoliberal urban agenda in which the market trumps all other priorities. Finally, in your reading for Module 2, you will encounter a rather unusual voice of dissent in the debate over the production of urban public space. 
Theorist Bern Bellina argues that the primary opponents in debates over public space, those who advocate a law and order approach which accepts revanchism and panopticism as the price to pay for urban safety, and those who advocate a social justice approach which rejects them, actually share more in common than they might think. While planting himself firmly in the social justice camp, Bellina argues that by accepting a bourgeois conception of public space, those who advocate for social justice implicitly accept fundamentally unacceptable premises. First, that public space is indeed a space of inclusion rather than an exclusionary space except in a highly idealized form. Second, that the struggle for social justice should be focused on the state rather than on capital. And third, that the existence of undesirables is something we should accept rather than understanding them as a reserve army of labor produced by the very logic of capitalism. So in sum, Bellina recommends that we abandon the entire argument over public space. Thus far, few have taken him up on this challenge, but in Module 3 we will review some of the ways in which social justice advocates have attempted to combat revanchism and its ilk through yet another concept by Henri Lefebvre, the right to the city.